inspiration that they have been. Lord, I just pray that you continue to lead this class and every class and just everything that we touch with our hands, Lord, that it be a benefit for your kingdom and that all the glory be for you. In your son's name, for his mother. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, so today is 2 Samuel chapter 19. And we make it verse 24. 19 and 24. Okay? And so kind of, I guess, a little bit of review from last week. Last week we actually covered a lot of text. Um, honestly, we could push really, really far this week as far as text goes to. Um, a lot of it is just, um, it's, it's very, very wordy. Um, but uh, we had uh, David, Absalom, Absalom's uh, death. Uh, we have uh, David is mourning David's return to Jerusalem and the happenings that kind of take place down through the day. Um, now, when he came down, uh, when his return, he comes back in, and one of the ones particularly was where we, like last week, that was um, Shania, where um, he, all of a sudden, um, he's the one that was cursing David, throwing the rocks at him, all those kind of things. Um, and then all of a sudden, here he is in his return, David's return, and he's the first one out there, falling down and saying, man, I've sinned, I've sinned against you, I've sinned against God. And um, David's response to him is that, really, is that he's forgiven. And then Abishai, um, the son of Zariah, the other son of Zariah, um, you know, immediately was like, oh man, you know, we should just kill him. You know, and uh, David's like, oh my gosh, what do I have to do? Once again, that statement, what do I have to do with you, the sons of Zariah? And then he says, man, should anybody die today? He says, for I do not know that today, I'm sorry, for do I not know that today I am the king over Israel? Therefore, the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king swore to him that it would be that way. Um, guys, uh, you know, to have that promise from the king, um, what should happen for every one of us is we all should die. We should all be thrown into hell. And have the king promise that that isn't what is going to happen. That's a pretty, pretty sweet day. Yeah? So, like, believe on me, and you shall be saved. Call my name. Yes? And you will be saved. Follow me, I'll make you. Yeah? I won't be a different things, but all those are is deliverance from destruction. Even the thing with the fisher of men. And the reason why I say that is because you look at all the stories about the servants. There's the two servants. Right? Both of them instructed. The one does, the other one doesn't. The one that doesn't, what always happens to them? They're always thrown into the fire. Tied up and thrown out. Yeah, the ones that do, and what's neat is, is that so what we run through in our flesh, oh my gosh, I gotta go do. Right? I gotta go fix on me, I gotta stop this, I gotta stop that, or whatever else. And God says, No, you follow me, and I'll do it. I'll do it for you. You know what that relieves then is it relieves the beast, it relieves the flesh from being able to have its weight in, which is really where a false religion comes into. Is it, um, what Jesus Christ does is he believes the ability for that false religion to even have a, a foothold. Yeah? Because the dependency then is all on him, it's not on himself. It's all on the individual, the person, the son of God, not on an institution. Yeah? Yes. Tracy? Yeah, me and Jason were talking to a young man up at the basketball court. He's going through a, a rehab program and all the different things there. And he was talking about, yeah, the higher power and the this and the that, and never giving glory to God and what he's really done, you know, so you can see this the false religion wrapping up in everything else except for that reality of Christ taking our sins away. Right. Right. And, you know, um, one of the fun things to do in that situation is say yes. So, yeah, you know what? You're right. The higher power. You have to have a higher power in order to be able to overcome. And there is no higher power than the living God, you know, and then we give the glory to God. Now, whatever they end up doing with it after that, we can't. Yeah, it really is. Like, we can't, we can't, you can't make somebody, I'm sorry, like, I tried. <laughs> you can't make somebody believe. Yeah, you can't make somebody forgive. 
You can't make somebody, you can't make somebody do those things. Now God, where man is incapable, God is able. Yeah? Does that make sense? But how, how, does, how does God work those things in us? Now this kind of comes back to what Tracy is kind of hitting on right there. So what, what is, how does God work those things in us? Okay? It comes through believing His words. It comes through believing that He is God, and that means that in the glory, not given to just this thing, but to Him. Yeah? The, the, the attention is to who? The trust is to who? You know, the, the dependency is on who? You know what I mean? So all that's just on Him, on Him, on Him, guys. And what's precious for all of us guys that have believed, what's precious is the King is already declared. You know what? You ain't going to die. You're not going to be separated from me for eternity. What you should get, the sun is right, is right. <laughs> we should get. That's what we should get, that's not what's coming. Not not for us. And that's that, that's a precious thing, guys. And you know, man, you guys uh we should just want that for every individual, for, for every soul out there. Verse 24. He says, Now Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he had not cared for his feet. Remember Mephibosheth, yes? He is the young man who was the son of Jonathan, who when Jonathan and Saul are killed in Gilboa, I believe it was, um, he falls. And in that fall of whatever, as they were trying to run away, um, he injured himself and his feet, and he was not able to walk without help. So Ziba, the servant of Jonathan, took him as a little boy. And raised him for all of those years. Until finally David seeks out if there's any relatives of Jonathan. So that he could keep his oath that he had given to Jonathan before the Lord. That he would take care of them as his own. So when he found Mephibosheth, he brought Mephibosheth in. He made him sit at the king's table. Which means that he had everything, like everything that any child of, of David had, that he had. All right. Um, every all the servants, everything else. I mean, he, he had he had, he had um, all of the territory that was Saul's. He gave to Mephibosheth, and with that, Ziba was entrusted to take care of. Okay. Then we have they had Absalom come in and take over, right? Create treason um, and take over. So during this quote unquote takeover. Uh, as David and they are leaving, Ziba shows up with donkeys and all of this food. Okay? And David's first question to Ziba was, is, I'm sorry, maybe not the first question, but one of the questions that he asked him is, is where is your master? Where is Mephibosheth? And he says, well, he stayed behind. And he said, and what, and I, what I think is he's hoping that the kingdom will be restored to the house of Saul, which means that would have been him, even in the next month. Okay? So then David turns around and says, well, if that is the case, if that's where his heart is at, then all of the land that was your master's now, it is yours. Clean and clear. And for a slave to inherit a king's territory, yeah, and um, all because he was willing to take care of the king and the king and what would have been the king's son, Jonathan's son, and then now King David. Ziba was always certain. Okay. Now the reason I'm bringing this all up again is for anybody who missed out on that whole portion. Um, this next kind of part in here is very.
what kind of bring peace to the whole matter um, with there being so much confusion. Uh, my, I, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't really matter what my personal beliefs are or whatever else. Uh, the way that it ended was Mephibosheth said, you know what? Since the king's first word basically was for Zeba to have it all, let him have it all. Well, you know what? If it was meant for Mephibosheth to have it, Mephibosheth would receive it back somehow, some way. Okay, there is a reality to that. Uh, like I said, my own personal beliefs doesn't really matter or whatever else. Uh, I think that um, Zeba, again, the things that we did know about Zeba all leading up to this point right here is there was never great grounds to uh, think that Zeba would go around just trying to slander and destroy people. And again, being a servant who had no right to anything, how, like what he would think that he would gain from that, outside of giving his own head cut off. I mean, think about it. I mean, David's, they, 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 like, for David being merciful in the son of Zariah thing, the whole thing about, oh my gosh, the son of Zariah, look at David in those other moments there where people try to come and slander or talk down about <clears throat> other individuals. And what did he do at every single I mean, sorry, what did, what did David do at every one of those times? Killed him. Immediately. Yeah. Um, so, again, just like, guys, I don't know, but at the end of the day, um, he did try to try to uh, kind of help the situation here. Now, um, neat little insight, though, is that David is still all about keeping his promise. Even from a fiction. Right? We'll see that a little bit later. Okay. All right? So, the lamb thing. I guess I'll just tell you this. Mephibosheth might have not had the land, but Mephibosheth still ate at the king's table. Okay? So he might have lost the physical things, but in the sense of the, the, the material having that land, but he still was able to partake in the king's table. Uh, Sometimes, guys, spiritually through us in life or whatever else, things might happen or whatever else. We might lose physical things in this life, but we're still able to eat from the king's table. And that's all that should matter at the end of the day. Yeah? Still living in the king's house or still eating from the king's table, that's a pretty dang good life. Yeah, no matter what things we might have or not have in this world. So then it carries on. It says, And Barzia, the Gileadite, came down from Raga, we'll go with that for right now, and went across the Jordan with the king and escorted him across the Jordan. Now, Barzilia was a very aged man, 80 years old, and he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed in Mahanaim. And now, if you go back and read the Mahanaim when he was there, uh, that there was somebody who had supplied them with all this different food because they said the men must be tired and thirsty and so forth and so on. Well, apparently, now we know that that's who that was, it was Barzilia. Uh, now, it says that, um, I'm sorry, I lost my spot. He says that he provided the king with all these things because he was a very rich man. And the king said to Barzilla, come across with me, and I will provide for you while you are with me in Jerusalem. So come to Jerusalem with me, and I'll take care of it. And Barzilla said to the king, and I love this, how long have I to live? And what should I go up with you, the king, to Jerusalem? I am today 80 years old. Can I discern between good or bad? Can your servant even taste what he eats or what he drinks? Can I even hear any longer the voices of the singing women and the singing men? Why then should your servant be a further burden on my lord, the king? In other words, all the wonderful things that I could go there and would experience from you, I'm so dang old, I wouldn't be able to enjoy any of it anyway, so what the heck is the point of me going all the way up there with you? <laughs> And I like the, the bluntness, the honesty, and the humility, and yet at the same time, um, nowadays, not very many people would admit, hey, listen, you know what, I'm too old to taste anything or to hear anything or to see anything or to do it. You know what I mean? Like, just the pride. He didn't have that pride for being a very, very rich man. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, you just see, like, some different things. I mean, this, I, I think I would really like this going right here. I, I would really enjoy sitting down with him uh, and, and, and talking with him. Uh, Probably a part of the heck of a lot of wisdom. Seems like a very, very wise man and very honest about the wisdom. Uh, 
And then what he does say, he says, we shall go, go a little ways across the Jordan with the king. But why should I, why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant turn back again, that I may die in my own city, near the grave of my mother and my father. And here is your servant, Chimachimachim. Chim let him cross over with my lord the king, and do for him what is good to him. Now what we find out, guys, in some while well, later on, um, is that this uh, young man here, it's actually reported by a historian as well. Um, don't remember the historian's name off the top of my head, but he's a very, very famous one. Uh, that, uh, anyways, this young man right here was the was the son of Brother Rosalia. So what he's saying is, I'm too old. I would never be able to enjoy him, and I'd never be able to experience it. But you know what? Here's my son as your servant. Let him go along with you, and then you give him what you, what you think is good. Yeah. Now the son. Obviously, his daddy was rich. The son, his heart fell. But that was not what was needed. Yeah? Whatever, you know, with this old man, his love for David, and again, guys, from the very, very beginning to the very, very end, what David was always about was about the message of Jesus Christ. And the respect from this old man, and then wanting his son, he knowing that he's dead, all the dead, wanting his son to go along with him to experience and you grow in things in the knowledge of David. It's a pretty honorable thing. Okay, I'll just tell you. Um, to take your son and say, oh yeah, son, go off with this person and learn from them. Yeah? That, that'd be a pretty honorable thing. Um, so the king answered, Jim Hanna, and says to him, he should cross over with me, and I will do for him what seems good to you. So it's funny, he turns back around on him. So the old man's like, hey, listen, man, you just take me some of them and you do whatever's good with you. He's like, all right, I'll take you some of you, but I'll do whatever's good for you. <laughs> he says, so now whatever you request of me, I'll do for you. Yeah, I think that's kind of funny. Because uh, honestly, guys, the Lord kind of with us, you know, he, he's just always for us. He really is always just for us. And, uh, you know, God, you know, like, you know, sometimes we do it, uh, I don't know. Just in, in our hearts or whatever else, just so uh, not believing that God is really just completely for us, I guess. And uh, even sometimes in our prayers and things like that, and just even in this right here, no, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I've mean, been on this really, really big. God's will be done. Yeah? And I kept on telling everybody, but I'm not trying to take away from the individualized, and I'm not saying not to pray for specifics. Yeah? Be wise enough, though, on the specifics, like I've had to learn. Lord, please give this to me as long as it does not destroy me or anybody else and things like that, right? Like, you know, like, make sure that, uh, Lord, you know, because you know what can really protect me, you know what can really hurt me. So, Lord, you guide me those things. Yeah? And trust him that he actually will. And that may be giving it or not giving it to you based on what he sees as necessary. Does that make sense? But it's amazing to me how much he really does want to give us what we want. Huh? Just like a father would. Just like a father would. Yeah? And uh, it is amazing to me. Because it's not necessary for the king to do that. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and the king had crossed over, and the king kissed Brasilia and blessed him, and he returned to his own place. Now the king went on to Gilgal. And Chimham went along with him. And all the people of Judea escorted the king, and also half of the people of Israel. So if you remember, there was the people of Judea, and the people of Israel, and there was a great fight within that. Um, out of the twelve tribes, guys, there was two of the tribes that were of Judea, there was the other ten that called themselves of sorry, excuse me, of Israel. Okay? Um, so, uh, okay, maybe I shouldn't have said that part yet, but anyways, that's how it was. Um, if you remember, after um, Absalom is killed, David was the one who had to send word to Israel to ask them, hey, am I not of your blood? And, uh, you know, and so forth, and bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh, and, and I and I that, and you're the one that you were trying to call as king is dead. I was the king that was learning from God. Why haven't you called for me to come back home? And then they said, oh, yeah, wait, wait, wait we shouldn't be doing that, right? And so then they sent him for him to come home. Now the house of Judea was with him this whole entire time. 
Now, but also that house of Judea was also of the family of Jesse, which is the father of David. Okay? So a little historical insights here. Just then all the men of Israel came to the king, and they said to the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judea, stolen you away and brought the king, his household, and all of David's men with him across the Jordan? Why have you, guys of Judea, stolen away our king to bring him into the city? So the men of Judea answered the men of Israel and said, Because the king is a close relative of ours, why then are you angry over this matter? Have we ever eaten at the king's expense? Or has he ever given us any gifts? So in other words, what are you all upset with us? Because we were the first ones to come with him as he came back in, and he is a close relative of ours. But you accuse us as if we're taking from the king. And the king not once has ever done anything specifically just for us. Anything that he did, he did for all. Yeah? So why are you jealous that we're the ones that are here with him right now? And by the way, where could they have been? They all could have been from the very, very beginning. They just didn't get there until right now. Does that make sense? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judea, and he said, We have ten shares in the king. Therefore, we also have more right to David than you. Because we have ten tribes, and you guys only have two. We have more right for him to go with us into the city of David. Then to walk in with you. Why then do you despise us? We were we not the first to advise, bring back our king? <laughs> Which is hilarious because it was David who had to send a messenger to them to tell them to send that message to him to come back. So really, they weren't the first ones, but that's okay. Guys, um, the, the kind of, I guess, historical kind of point here is um, all of this little nastiness kind of between the guys, if you go back, back, they're led out of Egypt, right? So you, you go back before before Egypt, right? And you have the troubles between the brothers, did you not? You know, and then um, you have um, uh, um, you have the father, uh, was it Isaac? Jacob? And I got them all. All the names are there. I'm just not sure now which one was who was who. Um, at which point in time. But uh, the father of the 12 sons. That was Jacob. So Jacob gives the blessings to each one of them. And in some of those blessings, we usually think of blessings just as like good things, right? But in some of those blessings, I mean, it was great warnings of what evil and what bad things that they were going to live out even towards each other, right? And with some of them, that they would be given the instructions, and they would go away from those instructions. He gave them to other ones that, hey, listen, you know, all of the other tribes will love you, and yet you will just seek to destroy all of the other tribes. Your brothers. He words it like that. The brothers. Yeah? But it was really what was going to happen later on. So then they all, they all end up in captivity. Right? They live all that time in captivity. Yes? And then all of a sudden... God hears that there was some, there was some that all of a sudden remembered the stories that they heard of, the, of the, their fathers, of the stories of God and his love, his deliverance, and him being greater. And so they started praying to God for deliverance from their captivity. So then God raises up Moses and Aaron, right? And then the rest of the story falls through there. They actually get led out, right? Then the 12 tribes, yes? And anyone else who was in Egypt that also went along with it. It doesn't tell us who all of that was, whether they, and probably Egyptians, and probably those from other countries, probably other slaves from other countries. It was probably a lot of different ones. And they came out with them, and they became a part of Israel. Okay? Uh, one of the, I think, I think the big point in that is, is that this whole thing about bloodlines and whatever have you, it's not what it was about. It was about the people, it was about the message of people believing that message. And everybody who believed that message was of Israel. Okay, and so they all come in, and sure enough, we see all these little battles and these little things go on right throughout all the judges. If you remember, every one of the judges that we went over, um, which were only the ones that were actually listed here in Hebrews, or there in Hebrews chapter eleven, but when we went through each one of those judges, what was going on every single time before God raised up one of those judges? Anybody? I 
heard whispers. Um, there was, so, uh, honestly, guys, there was multiple, there was kind of two parts to it. One is, is there was feuding that was going on from tribe to tribe. And then the second part would be is that there was the other Philistines, uh, there was all these other surrounding countries that were attacking and taking everything from them. And God would raise up a judge, and the judge would tell him, man, you know what, man, we're not believing God, we're not seeing God, we're not worshiping God, there's no sacrifice, there's no message of Christ, there's none of these things. This is why the calamity is coming on us. Let's change it up, let's get on it, let's be about the Lord, let's be about these things. And then all of a sudden, you have these victories, right? And, you know, one of my favorite ones is Gideon, I talk about that all the time, but him going up there on that hilltop, yeah, and then cracking open those those pottery things with ash and, and uh, charcoal in it, and as the fires roll down the mountain, the, the people, the armies, these great warriors, are all standing around, and what did he, what did he end up down to, his total numbers? 300? I thought it was even less than that. Right? It was 300 that he ended up with, and what did he start off with, like 30,000 or something like that? I can't remember, it was some ridiculous number, and God kept on sending them back, sending them back, sending them back. They ended down to 300, and they're facing a legion, you know, 10,000 trained soldiers, and, and all they do is break some buckets and yell, holler out, in the name of God, and by the sword of Gideon. And then everybody gets all scared, and they all start killing each other, because they didn't even know who was enemies and who was friends. And they all just start killing each other, and meanwhile, God's church has this great victory that day, and really didn't do anything except for yell. And, well, what they did do was follow God. They believed. They believed God's promise. That God was going to deliver. And they got up and they lived. Yes. And by living it, then they got to see miracles of God. And then we get to have those miracles today to hold on and to encourage our faith. Yes. The reason why I'm bringing this all up is because these little tribes right here, guys, you can see that there's always been this contention between them. Yes. Hatred and so forth and so on. What brought peace to all 12 tribes? Message, the promise, yes? The message of God. The promises. And when the king or the one that was over them was bringing those messages, so if you go before it, there was kings, then we had some of those there. Uh, who was the last one there? Was it Samuel? Samuel? Was it Samuel? And um, he was, you know, and so there he is, he's keeping everybody. Man, here's focus on the Lord. Here's focus on the Lord. And you see that there's peace amongst the tribes. Yeah? Guys, uh, listen, just in a nutshell, if all of us are here together and we remove the reality of Jesus Christ from us, how long are we going to be all happy, loving each other? Right? And so, with, you know, with them, guys, and spiritually, so with them, it was the same thing. All when the message of Christ and the reality of Christ is not there, then all of a sudden there's this turmoil. Yes? So why is this turmoil happening right here, right now, amongst these? Okay, why didn't they have any message? Okay. Historically, historically, what actually took place was, is you had one who tried to undermine that message. It's Absalom. And he undermines and undermines and undermines and destroys the king's reputa reputation. Does everything cancel? People would hear the king in his calling to the message of Christ. And instead, what they started to hear was is the calling of Absalom. Yes? Just like Satan is always calling. Proverbs says it this way. He says that there's wisdom and then there's, well, he uses different ones. The foolish woman, the harlot, he uses, he uses a few different names for her. But it's really just Satan. And all the things of this world is calling <coughs> back in the darkness. Yes? Now, what about those who are outside already? Okay? He keeps them there. And what is Israel supposed to be doing? Bringing the light to all of them. Yes? So why do you think Satan's so busy at trying to get them always at each other? <clears throat> so then they're distracted and they're not sharing with, they're not being that light to the rest. Yeah, they have the light, but they're not even able to bring it to anybody else because they're too busy fighting amongst each other. Yeah? Big spiritual things in this, guys, as far as, you know, and understanding that Satan's always trying to do that. And, guys, we don't have to let it. We hear the king's voice. No, we're just going to stay on that. You know what? 
sure I upset you sometimes. Thank God for his love and his forgiveness. Keep on forgiving me. You're going to upset me sometimes. You know what? Thank God for his love and his forgiveness. And I'm going to keep on forgiving you. And let's keep on watching for and see you and save that clock. Yes? Nice. Yeah? It says here that the words, uh, the words of the, Ju the men of Judea were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Okay, uh, as history continues on, guys, what ends up happening is, is that there ends up being a civil war, and I believe it's at the end of, of Solomon's life. Okay, so you had all the years of David, and then you get into the years of Solomon, and there's great peace during the years of Solomon as far as his word, just the reality of that word. Um, and then right there at his death is when all of a sudden you do have that to play. Chapter 20. So this fighting is going on between these two different groups. Yes? And there happened to be there a rebel amongst them. And that word rebel, interesting, the definition of that is a man of Baal. There's a foreign god. Yeah. A man with the heart of serving others. And his name was Sheba. And he was the son of I want to pronounce it how I see it, but I'm sure that's not how it's supposed to be pronounced. There you go. Like or right. That's a heck of a lot better. Vickery. Vickery. <laughs> That's closer to what I was... <laughs> well, in the English language, C-H is pronounced in a certain way. Alright? And I don't want to sound out like that. Alright? So, we'll go with Vickery. Or Vick Rye. We'll just call him Vick. <laughs> she was the son of Vick, of Benjamin. And he blew a trumpet and he said to all of them. So he drew their attention to himself. Just like Absalom, just like all of those who really are trying to undermine and distract from the gospel. Yeah? And I did make a point of this in my, I think, was that in here in Tuesday night class? I think it was, I don't know if it was, I think it was in the class. They're all meshing together now after about three weeks. Ago. Uh, Man, if somebody's trying to cause a disruption here, elders, if there's somebody trying to cause a disruption or whatever else, read it. Don't do something about it. I would rather have the destruction of you walking up and getting them and removing them from that distraction and then not be a distraction for the rest of the service in the class than allowing Satan to sit there and distract everybody. All right? Uh, all the rest of us. Now, if it's something that's really, really nature, let the elders take care of it. Okay? However, if Martha's up here busy talking the whole entire time, then Lisa, we know, can tap on the shoulder and say, hey, Martha, you know what, right now, let's listen to the words of God. You know, let's have that conversation after. <coughs> Now, I think I talked about that a little bit in the Monday Night Bible study, but I talked about it at another time in a little bit more detail. Yes, yeah, it doesn't have to be rude. It doesn't have to be rude. What, what was it? It was Tuesday? And Monday? Okay, I've been trying to kind of make a point of what I'm kind of talking about right now and before the pastor gets back in here, guys, honestly. So if any of you want to be upset with me, I guess be upset with me. And so that's the pastor with it. But, um, guys, I mean, just really respect. You know, and everything, and, and, and you know, I know the snowflake generation, everybody takes everything overly personal. Anytime anybody does say anything, you touch them and they just melt. And then, <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to you too. Um, oh, no, that's what it, they, they literally be coined the snowflake generation right now. And, um, like, and, but that snowflake generation, guys, we, we, you know, the other, but, you know, at the same time, guys, you know, respect is respect. You know, and, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's not even trying not to be, but we just <coughs> aren't thinking about it in that moment. So sometimes just a little reminder, don't be rude, don't be hateful about it, like, shh, be quiet, don't mess with me, no, don't, don't go there, you know, just a little gentle, and if you can't be gentle with it, then don't say nothing, then don't do nothing. Gentle, 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 okay? Yeah? But if you can, then do, all right? Good? <laughs> what happened? I see it. I see it. Okay, it's a distraction, guys. So he, he draws the attention, draws the attention to himself. Again, not drawing the attention to the Lord, drawing the attention to oneself. And then he says, man, I have no share in me. 
nor do I have any inheritance in the son of Jesse. So I don't have any part in David, and I'm not going to get any inheritance from him. So every man of Israel, go to his own tent. So every man of Israel deserted David, and they began to follow Sheba, the son of Bith. I can have so much fun with this right now, you know that? Have you ever met a son of a <laughs> bitch? I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Horrible time to joke. I, when I was studying this, I was like, Roger, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And I still, I just But the men of Judea, from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. Now David came to his house in Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep his house, and he put them in seclusion, but he supported them, and supported them. And, but he did not go into them anymore. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living as a widow. Okay? Those were ten concubines that Absalom had taken, and had forced himself on in front of all of Israel. Yes? So he personally did not go into them anymore. He did not go in and have sexual relations with them at that point going forward. He did not keep them in a public spectacle in front of all the people as a He did though support them. Okay? There, in my opinion, when it's stated that way, versus like Michelle, who was just locked away. He respected them, I think he still loved them, and he gave them more than anything that they ever wanted. They were very, very well taken care of, but they did not have the intercourse with the man from that point going forward. Nor were they a spectacle of the king and out in people's faces where they would be reminded of Absalom and all the nastiness that took place in that. Okay? I don't think it was done as a punishment to these women at all. Does that make sense? I think it's done as protection for the body and for the church, that they're not being distracted all the time thinking about the evil that was done. Does that make sense? Okay, and the king said to Amasa. Now, if you remember, Amasa is was the king, the captain, the leader of the entire army for Absalom. And after Absalom had died, he had made it away. But with him, the men of Israel, the army of Israel had followed. So one of David's things in becoming and coming back as the king was is to give him the position over the armies. Yes? And so with that, that brought everybody immediately under the rule of David again. In the moment that Amasa agreed to this. Okay? So he tells me, he says, Assemble all men from Judea for me within three days, and present yourself also here with them. So Amasis went and he assembled the men of Judea, but he himself delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Beth, will do us more harm than Absalom. So take your Lord's servant and pursue him, lest he find for himself a fortified city and escape us. So Joab's men. With the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and I went back and I made sure, but I looked this up and everything, so those were actually um, hired hands of Israel. Warriors. Okay? And all the mighty men, so all the mighty men that they had, and they went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Ben. When they were at the large stone, which is in um, Gibeon, Amasa then came there before them. Now, what was he doing all that time? He had three days to go gather up all the men. Then they're traveling. I don't think it said exactly how long, but they've been traveling, so I assume he's probably four days, five days now has gone by. And then all of a sudden, he shows up out there on the road. So then it says, now Joab was dressed in his battle armor, and on it was a belt with a sword fastened to it in its sheath at his hips. 
And as he was going forward, he, it fell out. Then Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice that there was the sword that was in Joab's hand. And he struck him with it in the stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground. And he did not strike him again. And thus he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Abed. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, then follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw, and when the man saw that all the people that stood still, he took Amasa and he moved him away from the highway into the field, and then he threw a garment over him. And when he saw that everyone who came halted. So when he was removed from the highway, all people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bith. Pause for a second. So what happened? Different, different scenarios, okay? Joab kills him. I mean, there ain't no doubt of it. Joab goes up to him as if it's going to be a friendly encounter. Yes? Uh, now, the one picture that I have in my mind is, is that maybe literally the sword that would have been normally on his side, that even, what was his name? The guy who just got killed? Masa. Um, Masa that he sees the sword fall out on the ground as he's dismounted. And Joab walks up to him and says, hey, how are you? Grabs his beard and goes in like he's going to give him a kiss. And in this hand over here, has a knife. And when he does it, sticks it into his gut and pulls across. So all the entrails fall out on the ground. And then he leaves him there. Now, if you remember, even with the man who had killed their brother, they struck him multiple times. They did stick him in the stomach, but it was multiple times. Faster death. Did not break open his entrails. Things like that. Why so brutal right here? That's an issue that his people. Okay. Joab though, was pretty smart about not wanting to disturb his men in the sense of thinking that he never wanted them to think that he would uh, go against them. He always wanted them to know that they could trust him and that he would give his own life for them. Okay? Okay. I think that, you know, possibly both um, are true. Um, personal vendetta, he lost his position after killing Absalom. And who it was given to him was a Muslim. But. I don't think, and a lot of historians think that that's just it right there. That that's the end of the story right there. Right? He hated him because he had taken his position, so he went over there, he killed him, and took his position back. Okay? Because that, that is what happened. Okay? As far as just that part goes. I couldn't help but wonder where was he at? And because it made a key note to even mention that he was told to be back with all of the men in three days. And he was not. And so then King David, instead of giving Amasa the orders to lead, does not give Joab the orders either, but instead gives them to Abishai to lead the armies. And then, as they're on this journey, trying to find this son of a bitch. Son of a bitch. <laughs> All of a sudden, Amasa shows up out there on the road to meet them by himself. Okay, where was he for that period of time? How did he know where they would be and on what road that they would be on? He is the same gentleman that helped Absalom overthrow David in the first place. One thing about Joab was, is Joab's loyalty 100% was, is that God's anointed 
was David. And anybody else who might even, if they even might, in some way, some form, try to hurt or harm or anything, take take discredit anything. That, that, you know, Abishai, the reason why did he want to kill that one guy? Was because the one guy was just saying stuff about David. Does that make sense? Kill him. Now here's this guy. Where has he been? And how? Again, guys, how do you even know where to be on that road? I can't help it. I start looking at it. I'm like, yeah, man, what this looks like? This looks like a traitor. He's already been a traitor once before. He sent out to go get all of the men to go find him and kill, and then he doesn't even show up himself. But then finds them out there on this one road. I mean, there was many, many roads. But finds them on this one road. Now, there ain't no doubt that that road right there was a major road. So maybe it would have been easier to find them on that road and been kind of a normal thing. Oh, this would have been the way they would be going. Maybe it would have been. Maybe he already knew the intel of more or less where they were looking. So he knew where to meet up with them. Maybe it was completely innocent. Maybe he had diarrhea. And so for two days, he just couldn't go nowhere. He had the flu. And so maybe he was at home and was like, man, I'm going to miss out on this battle. I need to get out there. And so then he runs out and meets them out there on the road. Maybe it was completely innocent on a muscle side. But this one thing I do know about Joab is that if there was even the possibility, Joab was an elder of elders. If there was even a possibility that the king was going to be attacked and going to be hurt, then they were dead. Protect the king, protect the body, protect the church at all costs. Even if that meant his own judgment, that he was going to have to face God on these things. He was willing to face God because at the end of the day, he was going to do the best that he thought in that sense. Okay? I'm not telling everybody to go out there and kill or anything like that. All right? There's a time and place. Yeah, no. <laughs> and it's like, I got you. I got you. <laughs> like, you can down your purse. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, guys, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I myself think that, and the reason why it was so open in front of everybody, the reason why he left him, and there is no doubt, guys, um, you know, if, if that, I mean, historically, guys, you know, through World War II and things like that, you know, in World War One, there was instances and situations that it was even filmed and stuff. What happens to a person, the natural things, when when that happens, the first thing you want to do is you want to try to put back. When your entrails come out, first thing you want to try to do is you want to try to put back. You want to try to live. You want to try to survive. The pain is so intense that you cannot feel anything. But you know that you are... Um, you want to survive, but you can't. The weakness as the blood flow is lost causes you to not be able to stand. And so you fall down into the pot. Meanwhile, you're still scrapping and trying to survive and live. I think that there is a side to it that he didn't want all the men to see this part. I think he wanted all the men to see that, you know what, at the end of the day, David was going to be king no matter what. And if anybody wanted to go against David, wanted to even act or even smell like or even look like they might be a traitor, and I think he wanted all of them to know what happens to a traitor. That's what I think. That's just what I think. You can draw your own conclusions. Sorry. I tried to clean off my glasses and all I did was make it like 10 times worse. <laughs> I found a spot and I just put a spot all over the house. So now I can't see any of you. There's blood that's everywhere. So again, guys, that's that's my thought. You know, you can draw your own conclusions from it, all right? To me, um, again, in my rationale, that's what I see. I see a man who loved his king, who was bent and determined that he was going to do everything he could to protect his king. Okay? I also love the other soldier that is here. I love that he doesn't want them to wallow in the death and what they have seen. But the question that he puts out there to each and every one of them is, if you favor Joab and if you're for David, then you follow Joab. If you don't, run now. 
But if you do, come on. And yet, as any of them in that moment were going past the men, the next group that was walking up, as any of us would do if, we, if there was something that brutal right there on the road, we would be like, oh my God. Yeah? So then he looks at this situation and he's like, man, I've got to remove this obstacle that's tripping up everybody else. The reason why David did not kill that one man is because he didn't want an obstacle to be for everybody that was following him. Joab did not have the same wisdom because Joab was the son of Zerai. They were, they were bloody men. So he didn't have that thought of, oh, this is my trip of all of them. And I appreciate that God had this other soldier there not only to call out the reality, and man, listen, if you're going to be about him, to follow him, but then also to remove the offense from the road. And you would cover it up. Because all of our offenses would always keep anybody from following Christ. And I thank God that Jesus Christ came here and removed it and covered it. And we don't have to live on it. Yeah? But instead, we can follow and be about our king. Okay? He went through all tribes of Israel to Abel, Beth, Makkah, Makkah, and all the Barites. So they all were gathered together and also went after Sheba. Then they came and they besieged him in Abel. And they cast up a siege mound. Now a siege mound was literally debris and dirt. And what you would do is that a good fortified city, if you couldn't break into it, you broke over it. And so they would literally come up and start throwing debris up towards it to make a mound of the wall. Okay? So they cast up a siege mound against the city, and it stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So they beaten on that wall. Yeah? Then a wise woman. Here, wise women. <laughs> then a wise woman cried out from the city. Here, here. Literally, listen, listen. Please say to Joab, come nearby that I may speak with you. So when he had come near to her, the woman said, are you Joab? And he answered, I am. Then she said to him, hear the words then of your maid, sir. And he answered, I am listening. And so she spoke this. They used to talk in former times, saying, they shall surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would in disputes. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said to her, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not so. But a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bith, by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. So the woman said to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. And the woman, in her wisdom, in her wisdom, wisdom is from God, she went to all of the people of Abel. And they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Beth, and threw it out to Joab. So then he blew on a trumpet, and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. And so Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. Pause again real quick. So they seek after him. The, situ the situation there with Amasa had taken place. They continue on. They find out where he's at, what city he's in. They go up to that city. They build a mound. As they're building it and everything else, they're beaten on the walls. And 
the only person wise enough, brave enough, I don't know what you want to call it, crazy enough. But here she is called wise, which means that she had reality of the Lord in his words, in his guidance. It means that she had the writings and the oracles, the messages of God as she believed. So she goes up on the city, and it's amazing to me, too, that she knew who she was going to be calling for. She knew to call for Joab. She calls Joab, and what she presents to him is such a beautiful thing. First, she declares what she is going to be to him. His servant. She's going to serve him, Joab, with her wisdom. Then, she just asks him to first do one thing, to hear me. Then she says, listen, in former times, so he would know this, Joel would know this, that they would come to Abel, the town of Abel, to seek guidance to end disputes. And historically, Abel was a place of, that was considered to be filled with wise people. And when you needed to know what to do to end a problem or an issue that you were having, you would go there and you would discuss it with them and then they would pray together and find the answer of the Lord. And it would always end whatever dispute was going on. Whatever problem was brought there to Abel would always be answered. Pretty awesome, yeah? And so she brings this to the remembrance of Joab. And don't you realize that if you come here, it's not to fight and destroy, but it's to end disputes and problems. Shouldn't that be the church? We don't come here to argue. No, we come here to end arguments. We don't come to fight against God, but we come to be delivered from the fight. Yeah? And then she goes on to say, you know, because, you know, and she declares herself, I am among those who are peaceable, who just want to live at peace, and who are faithful, full of reality in the Lord. And what I see that you're doing is you're seeking to destroy the whole city and all of its peoples and all of its inhabitants. A mother, one who gives birth to life. Now, she's not talking about her physical body and her being a woman and therefore having birth of a child. What she's talking about is the birth of the message of Christ, of the message of God, unto this world. She says, listen, if you destroy this city, then what you destroy it is a piece of wisdom and faithfulness that was what Israel was always supposed to be. A lighthouse. A mother, we always bring God's words. And you sought to destroy us this day. And Joab says, wait a minute. I didn't come here to destroy you. I didn't want to destroy the message. What I came after was one who sought to destroy the king. We got to undermine his teacher. That's all I'm here for. She says, good. Now that I know what you're here for, I'll give you his head. <laughs> She goes in and gathers up the people of Abel. And she tells them, this is what he's here. So all the people find him, drag him out into the street, and cut off his head. They never open the doors, just in case. Lies. But they go up to the gate, and they throw over the head. There you go. And the dispute ended. It was over. Yeah? She brought truth. Joab brought truth. And one of the big reasons why I don't think that Joab even there with Amasa, why it was just something as far as himself and just gaining back that position. Because even this right here, if it was just about himself, and he's like, wait a minute, no, I'm not here to try to destroy anybody in the city, sort of thing. I'm not out just to kill. 
but I am out to protect. Yeah? Guys, the, the message and by that the inheritance of the Lord that can be passed out to so many. I don't think anybody in that town woke up that day and said, hey, listen, let's go cut somebody's head off. I don't think they took pleasure in it. Okay? But at the same time, he was already against, and he was already against that message. Sheep. Okay? Which means he was already dead. And in their wisdom, they could see that. And it was better to cut off than it was to allow. It goes on to say, Joab was over all the army of Israel. And I am the son of that guy. Jehaiba, Jehaida, Jehaida, Joel, yeah. Which saw the Cherethites and the Pelethites. Aharon was in charge of the revenue. Jehoshaphat, I said it right two weeks ago. The son of Ahadah was recorded. Sheba was the scribe. Zadok and Abethar were the priests. So they were still doing their job. Yeah. Right now I'm priest. And Hero and Jerry was a chief minister on the day. We're gonna have to stop there, guys. I wanted to get, I thought, and I thought we would get, but we'll have to get another time. We're gonna have to stop there. Listen. Not asking anybody to go out there and cut off heads or anything. <laughs> Usually, I'm not asking for anybody to go out there and chop a head. No, guys, you know now, today, no longer. Guys, listen, listen to this. This is this is this is scripture. It's a scripture. No longer is our battle with flesh and blood. No longer do we yield a sword of steel. But our battle now is against principalities and powers, against spiritual things that are unseen. And the sword that we now wield is the words of God. So do we take off heads? Not with an actual sword, but we do with the words of God. Do we disembowel? You know what? If it's the words of God and it cuts through, because it says that it even cuts through even to the marrow of the bone. It cuts through everything. Even opens up what's on the inside of the bone. It reveals the inner heart of the man. So out of the head, the thoughts, the cares, the me, my, and I, things of this world, with a sword, we no longer cut off the head, but with the words of God, the beast, we do slay. Yes? Yes. Well, we're not about opening up people like that right there. We are about opening up the hearts of people for them to be able to see the Lord. Yes? As uh, for some, the words of God are more brutal than what a, sword, than what a physical sword would have been. We think, oh my gosh, you know, the head got cut off and the bowels on the ground. But guys, honestly, the torment, at least those people died and died pretty soon thereafter. And their torment and what they're caused to torment to others was more. And whether you like this statement or not, which means that their judgment in hell was less. There's many others that the words of God come to and cut through, and yet they live in the rebellion of it. Their judgment, according to the Lord, is worse. Okay? So, and for as horrible as you might think that that is, some of it might have been actually a lot more merciful than what we understand. God works in mysterious ways. Okay? But I want us to understand something. Getting off of the killing and murdering and all that. It's what now what we heal, what we will, is to bring life and salvation and deliverance. We at all costs protect the body. Protect
protect the past, protect the work, protect the cooperation. Yes. Yes, you may. All right? But it's not with swords and blades, but it is with the words of God. Yes? Yes. For us guys, you know, when it cut us open, it cut us open that allowed us to be saved. When it cut off the head of our beast, the e minor nine, that's where we got saved. Does that make sense? It was all spiritual, it wasn't done with physical. Yeah? And so guys, you know, the same things, a lot of the same principles still apply. It's just in a different, it's in a spiritual facet, not a physical. Yeah? And I'm thankful for the Joabs and the Abishai's that we do have. In our body. Okay? Thanks, something's right. <laughs> and I'm very, very thankful for them. Because they give, the, they give their lives for you. And a lot of them, you don't even know who they are. But they would give their lives for you. They love you. They love this church. They love the pastor. And they'll be the first ones in the front of any fight. Spiritual or physical. All right? So thank God for them. Yes? Thank God for Joab and for that God. Literally, those men, even know their ways sometimes very clear. Okay? And I thank God most of all for David and for his kingship. Thank God for the message that David was always about bringing. Thank God that that same spirit is in you. I thank God for you women, you wise women that hold the truth and are about bringing that truth to others in any disputes, especially the dispute between men and God. Yeah? So I thank God for it. Men and warriors, march on. Just keep on. Keep on following the kingdom. And we'll do well. Whatever battle we come up against, God will give us the victory over. And maybe we don't even have to do nothing except for something inside the wall. And whatever God needs to be won, will be won by somebody else on the other side. I don't know. But for us, let's just keep on marching on. Yes? Wise men, speak words of wisdom. Wise women, teach wise words. Yes? Yes. I love you all very, very much. I'm thankful for you. I'm you guys next time. Let's keep on pressing on. Yeah.